Chapter Eleven of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Eleven. Mister Hearty becomes extremely unpopular. Hearty may be all ims and whiskers, Bindle had said, and I ate his oily look and oily ways, but he sticks to his job and works like a blackleg. It don't seem to give him no pleasure, though he don't often smile and when he does it's as if he thought god was a-going to charge it up against him mr hearty was an excellent tradesman he sold nothing that he had not bought himself and covent garden knew no shrewder judge of what to buy and what not to buy or as bindle phrased it he's so used to looking for sin in the soul that he can see a rotten apple in the middle of a barrel without knocking the top off yes i'll give hearty his due there ain't many as can knock spots off im as a greengrocer though as far as being a man i seen better things than im come out of cheese on the saturday morning after bindle's visit to dick little mr hearty was busily engaged in superintending the arrangement of his fulham high street shop giving an order here and a touch there always with excellent results according to his wont he had returned from market before eight o'clock breakfasted hurried round to his other shop in the wandsworth bridge road and before ten was back again at fulham he was occupied in putting the finishing touches to a honey-coloured pyramid of apples each in its nest of pink paper like a setting hen when an ill-favoured man entered leading an enormous dog in which the salient points of the mastiff bull terrier and french poodle struggled for expression the man looked at a dirty piece of paper he held in his hand name of arty he interrogated i am mr hearty was the reply uttered in a voice that was intended to suggest dignity with just a dash of christian forbearance i brought your dog said the man with ingratiating geniality bearing three dark brown stumps that had once been teeth i brought your dog he repeated looking down at what appeared to be four enormous legs loosely attached to a long sinuous body you're mistaken said mr hearty it's not mine i don't keep a dog my mistake governor replied the man with a grin i should have said the dog what you were a-lookin for here lily drop it the last remark was addressed to the dog who seeing mr hearty's soft black felt hat lying on a box had seized it in her enormous jaws she looked up at her master and shook the hat roguishly with a gurgle of joy but a sharp cuff on the muzzle caused her to drop what her teeth and saliva had already ruined this is just the dog you're wantin continued the man pleasantly indicating lily who had lain down and was now occupying the entire centre of the shop looking about her with distended jaws and a great flap of whitey red tongue hanging out amiably playful as a kitten and an ouse dog as a would eat a burglar and then go back to dog biscuit without a murmur she's some dog is lily but i don't want a dog replied mr hearty eyeing his hat which the man was endeavouring to clean with his coat sleeve will you please take it away there was a note of asperity in his voice don't want a dog don't want a dog there was menace in the man's manner that caused mr hearty some anxiety and he looked appealingly at smith his chief assistant and the boy who stood regarding the episode with an enjoyment they dare not express don't want a dog repeated the man for the third time you just read this thrusting out towards mr hearty the dirty piece of paper he held in his hand you just read this and you'll ruddy well see that you do want a dog and this here is the dog you want mr hearty mechanically took the piece of paper the man thrust towards him it was a cutting of an advertisement which read dog wanted breed not important provided it is a large and good house dog not to cost more than four pounds apply personally with animal to alfred hearty five thirty fulham high street southwest on saturday at ten thirty a m mr hearty looked from the paper to lily's owner in an uncomprehending way and then back to the advertisement again the breed ain't important in lily remarked the man she's took prizes as a mastiff a french poodle a bull terrier and a palm and she got honourable mention as greyhound once she'll chaw up a man she don't like won't you lily old gal lily looked up with a ridiculously amiable expression for a dog possessed of such qualities 
but i don't want a dog repeated mr hearty looking helplessly at smith then what the grumblin hereafter do you put in this advertisement for growled the man angrily but i didn't is your name arty i am mr hearty then you want a dog and lily's your dog and i want four pound now and it over governor i'm in a hurry i ain't a bloomin non-stop at that moment a middle-aged woman entered followed by a very small boy with a very large dog as indeterminate as to pedigree as lily herself the woman looked about her and approached smith mr hearty she almost whispered smith a man of few words jerked his thumb in the direction of his employer the woman walked over to him meanwhile the new dog had growled ominously at lily who throwing out her forepaws and depressing her head upon them had playfully challenged it to a romp mr hearty meekly inquired the woman as she spoke a woman and two more men with other dogs entered the shop these were quickly followed by another woman of a, i know what i want and uggins is my name and i've got me marriage lines appearance following her came a mild-mannered man with yet another dog larger and more bewildering in the matter of breed than lily and the other animal combined i want to see mr hearty announced the third woman to smith smith indicated mr hearty in his usual manner by a jerk of the thumb i come in answer to the advertisement she announced for a dog inquired lily's owner suspiciously for an housekeeper replied the woman aggressively what's that got to do with you you ain't mr arty are yer you just shut your ugly face the man subsided the shop was now full lily and the second dog had decided to be friends and had formed an alliance against the third dog in their gambols they had already upset a basket of apples whilst mr hearty was endeavouring to convince lily's owner that not only did he not require a dog but as a matter of fact he had a marked antipathy for the whole species other animals continued to arrive they grouped themselves outside with their owners together with a nondescript collection of men women and boys with and without dogs all seemed inspired with the same ambition to interview mr hearty mr hearty looked at the sea of faces outside as an actor suffering from stage fright might gaze at the audience that had bereft him of the power to speak or move he felt that he must act promptly even sternly but he was not a brave man and saw that he was faced by a crowd of potential enemies summoning up all his courage he turned to lily's owner kindly remove that dog he ordered in what he meant to be a stern voice indicating lily who was playing a game of hide-and-seek round an apple barrel with a pomeranian irish terrier who are you talking to just answer me that demanded lily's owner mr hearty saw clearly that the man intended to be awkward even insolent i am speaking to you and unless you take that dog away i-i mr hearty stopped wondering what he really would do what ought he to do under such circumstances why did you advertise demanded the aggressive woman i didn't replied mr hearty miserably turning to his new assailant i have advertised for nothing didn't you advertise for a housekeeper continued the woman no you're a blinkin liar at this uncompromising rejoinder mr hearty started he was unaccustomed to such directness of speech unless you are civil i shall order you out of my shop retorted mr hearty angrily and if you do i shan't go see the woman placed her hands on her hips and looked at mr hearty insultingly look at him she continued addressing the crowd playing his dirty jokes on poor people i paid eightpence return to get here all the way from brixton then he says it's a joke there was an ominous murmur from the others all sorts of epithets were hurled at mr hearty will you pay our fares i'll punch his bloomin head till it aches let me at him you dirty tyke you want to buy my dog demanded lily's owner thrusting his face so close to mr hearty's that their noses almost touched no i'm not shouted mr hearty in desperation smith put this man and his dog out smith looked embarrassed and lily's owner laughed outright a sneering insulting laugh which his black stumps of teeth seemed to render more sinister and menacing mr hearty felt that the situation was passing beyond his control how had it all happened and what did it mean events had followed upon one another so swiftly that he was bewildered where were the police 
what did he pay rates and taxes for if he were to be subjected to this what would be the end of it all would they kill him just as he saw himself being bruised and buffeted by a furious crowd a shadow fell across the shop as a pantechnicon drew up outside it was one of three and from the tailboard of the last bindle slipped off and began forcing his way towards the shop entrance now then he called out cheerfully make way there i'm the brother of the corpse what's it all about a fire or a dog show the crowd good-humouredly made room pushing his way into the shop he hailed his brother-in-law hello arty oldin a levy what o i wants a dog broke in the dog man indicating lily with a jerk of his thumb put them all away from brixton shouted the would-be housekeeper and very nice too replied bindle as he pushed his way to the side of mr hearty who was listening with anguished intentness to an eager group of women whose one desire seemed to caretake for him bindle looked round the shop with a puzzled expression his eyes finally resting on lily call that a dog he inquired of lily's owner with an incredulous grin yes i do replied the man aggressively what did you call it a rosy kitten well remarked bindle imperturbably regarding lily critically since you arsts me i'd call it a bloomin history o dogs in one volume will you have the coal governor bawled a voice from the fringe of the crowd at that moment mrs hearty entered from the parlour behind the shop she gazed about her in mild wonderment we don't want any coals alf we had them in last week mrs hearty subsided into a chair suddenly her eyes fell upon lily who was trying to shake off her head mr hearty's hat which someone had placed there and she collapsed helpless with laughter ere get out of it cried bindle giving lily a cuff whereat she yelped dismally providence had evidently intended her for doughty deeds having endowed her with the frame of an amazon but had then lost interest and given her the heart of a craven by dint of threats badinage and persuasion bindle at last cleared the shop of all save mr and mrs hearty smith and the boy posting the staff at the door with instructions to admit no one bindle approached his brother-in-law what yer been doin arty the old bloomin streets full of carts and people wantin to see yer i brought three vans what's it all about never had mr hearty been so genuinely pleased to see bindle before he had time to reply to his question a big man pushed his way past smith and entered the shop where'll you have the beer governor he shouted in a thick hearty voice redolent of the trade here come out of the way shouted a small wiry man who had followed him in all this little lot going he asked nodding in the direction of the crowd that blocked the street i only got three breaks and they won't take em all what's your little game bindle inquired of the newcomer the brakeman eyed him with scornful contempt you mr arty he inquired i'm his brother he's been took ill there's a mistake you better get home get home shouted the man who's going to pay try lloyd george suggested bindle cheerfully a policeman pushed his way into the shop and bindle slipped out the real drama was being enacted outside from all directions a steady stream of people was pouring towards mr hearty's shop hearty hearty murmured bindle joyously to himself as he surveyed the high street what have yer been and done the place presented an extraordinary appearance there were coal carts strings of them brewers drays laundry carts railway vans huge two-horse affairs pantechnicons chara banks large carts small carts and medium-sized carts there were vehicles with one two and three horses there were motor cars motor vans motor lorries and motor cycles there were donkey carts spring carts push carts and pull carts everything capable of delivering goods was represented and all were locked together in a hopelessly congested mass everything had come to a standstill and the trams strove in vain to clang their way through the inextricable tangle the footpaths were crowded with men women boys and dogs all endeavouring to reach mr hearty's shop the mecca of their pilgrimage crowds overflowed the paths into the roadway and seemed to cement together the traffic bindle passed along the line intent on gleaning all the information he could have yer come after the job a housekeeper nurse or dog he asked one seedy-looking man with an alarming growth of nose 
how about my railway fare inquired lily's owner recognizing bindle who's going to pay it you're going to pay it yourself old sport unless you're going to walk then eyeing the man critically he added a little exercise might ease your figure a bit bindle pushed among the throng of disappointed applicants for employment and deliverers of goods fate had been kind to him in sending him this glorious jest might have been found in a colony he muttered as he passed from group to group he ain't forgot nothing plumbers bricklayers vans housekeepers dogs kids to adopt horses carpenters caretakers shovers and he's ordered everything whatever growed or was made including beer enough to keep the guards drunk for a year arty's mad poor chap religion do take some that way at first bindle had been puzzled to account for the throngs of applicants but inquiry made things very clear in every case the advertisements and they had appeared in every daily and innumerable weekly papers stated the wages which were unusually high a vanman was offered fifty shillings a week a housekeeper thirty shillings a week all found for an errand boy fifteen shillings a week was suggested and ten pounds as a bonus to the parents of the child that was to be adopted the officials at putney bridge station were puzzled to account for the extraordinary increase in the westward bound traffic on that saturday morning but what particularly surprised them was the stream of dogs that each train seemed to pour forth the run upon dog tickets at certain east end stations broke all records and three station masters had to telephone to headquarters for a further supply dogs occupied the gangways of every train arriving at putney bridge station between ten a m and ten forty a m dogs growled fawned and quarrelled the stream of dogs however was as nothing to the stream of men women and boys and small children for adoption the station officials and the bus man outside wearied of instructing people how to get to fulham high street the congestion of traffic in fulham high street was felt as far east as piccadilly and the strand where the police on point duty were at a loss to account for it the disorganization in the tram service was in evidence equally at wood green and wandsworth certain elements in the crowd notably the younger and more light-hearted sections in particular those who lived in the neighbourhood and were not out of pocket for railway fares were inclined to regard the whole affair as a huge joke and badinage flowed freely there was however another section that thirsted for somebody's blood and was inclined to regard mr hearty as the person most suitable to supply this in the immediate vicinity of the shop door the excitement was intense everyone pushing and striving to get nearer there was no suggestion of personal feeling save in the case of those who were bent on the same errand thus a potential housekeeper felt nothing but friendliness for a would-be dog seller whilst the hopeful housemaid was capable of experiencing almost an affection for a mother who had a spare offspring she was wishful of having adopted when the first brewer's dray drew up it was greeted with cheers and one man who drove up in a donkey cart with a flashily dressed young woman was greeted with the inevitable who's your lady friend i'm surprised at you it isn't the one i saw you with at Ampstead." sung by a score of robust voices cries catcalls and advice to those inside to save a drop for uncle and hurry up were continuous many crude jokes were levelled at mr hearty's name when the helmets of the police were seen bobbing their way through the crowd there were prolonged cheers the first policeman to arrive having foreseen the possibility of trouble had promptly telephoned for assistance at the time the reinforcements arrived including an inspector and two mounted constables the attitude of the crowd was beginning to assume an ugly look one of the more aggressive spirits had endeavoured to single out mr hearty as a target for one of his own potatoes but he had unfortunately for him hit the policeman whose action had been so swift and uncompromising that there was no further attempt at disorder the inspector quickly saw that very little that was coherent could be obtained from mr hearty it was bindle who supplied the details of what had occurred Artie's me brother-in-law he replied he's either gone off his onion or somebody's been pulling his leg all this ere little lot and bindle indicated the congested high street as brought him things they says he's ordered and he says he ain't and them crowds of men and women and dogs and kids has come saying he wants to give em jobs or ohms 
the inspector asked a few questions and gleaned sufficient information to convince him that this was a huge practical joke and that prompt action was imperative he telephoned for four men and set to work in an endeavor to organize the traffic and reduce it to manageable proportions constables were placed at different points along the main thoroughfare leading to fulham high street asking all drivers and chauffeurs if they were bound for mr alfred hardy's shop in fulham high street and if so sending them back men were stationed at hammersmith and putney high street to divert the streams of traffic that still poured towards fulham putney and fulham had never seen anything like it families went dinnerless because housewives either could not get to the shops or could not get away from them again telephones rang and irate housekeepers inquired when the materials for lunch were coming taxicab drivers with fares sat stolidly at the wheel conscious that their income was increasing automatically whilst the fares themselves fumed and fussed as they saw their twopences vanish it was not until past one o'clock that the trams restarted and it was two thirty before bindle got back to the yard with his three pantechnicons poor old Hardy's got it in the neck this time he muttered as he turned back towards fulham high street to lend a hand in putting things straight mr hardy was distracted at the thought that none of his customers had received their fruit and vegetables and bindle was genuinely sorry for him all that afternoon and late into the night he worked helping to weigh up and deliver orders and when he eventually left the shop at a few minutes before midnight he was as tired as a performin flea i like Artie when he goes mad he muttered to himself as he left the shop it sort of wakes up sleepy old fulham i wonder who it was shouldn't be surprised if i could spot him if it ain't mr dick little call me jack johnson i wish he hadn't done it though bindle was thinking of the pathetic figure mr hardy had cut and of the feverish manner in which he had worked to make up for the lost hours bindle had been genuinely touched when as he was about to leave the shop his brother-in-law had shaken him warmly by the hand and in an unsteady voice thanked him for his help then looking round as if searching for something he had suddenly seized the largest pineapple from the brass rail in the window thrust it upon the astonished bindle and fled into the back room for some seconds bindle had stood looking from the fruit to the door through which his brother-in-law had disappeared then replacing it on the rack he had quietly left the shop muttering it takes a long time to get to know even your own relations queer old card artie end of chapter eleven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com